This is Leisha Holmes and I'm your host on the Recruiters Recruitment Podcast and I'm always a little bit excited when we go international and that we invite somebody from across the waters but he's actually based over originally from the UK so it's always nice to hear a global story and it's somebody that I've personally been recommended to speak to by another podcast host so that's always nice too. So without further ado I'd like to welcome Justin Maguire who is the co-founder of MCG Talent to the pod. Welcome to you today Justin, how are you? Hello Leisha, yes I'm very well thank you, how are you? I am very well. It's been lovely to get to know you before we press record. And, you know, so there'll be lots of people listening thinking, oh, gosh, this sounds like a very interesting journey. So tell us about who you are, your little journey to where you are today. And then we're going to obviously expand on that further and a bit about MCG talent as well, please. Sure. OK, all right. My career started in the UK. Um, I first of all was in a communication and advertising business. So I did brand funded programming for those people that don't know what that is. I basically work with brands to get them on air, but um, in a way that doesn't sound like advertising. So um, uh, it was a very, we called it below the line uh, communications, which was great, very creative. Um, And then from that, I I was in, it was, it was this thing called digital came bumbling along, you see. And then uh, (laughs) in 2006, when I was wondering what to do with my life, um, whether I would stay in agency or go to another job. I decided um, to actually go to another country. I went to Honduras and taught kids English. So I had a complete break from uh, communication. So I lived in Latin America and came back looking for a job in communications and realized that with my experience, I couldn't find a recruiter that understood what the heck brand funded programming was, why I went to Latin America for a year and what I wanted to do next. So I got sent to like newspaper interviews and all sorts of weird stuff that I wasn't interested in. So I decided that rather than um, rely on recruiters, I would be the recruiter. Love um, it. Yeah, but I, the only the only recruiters I knew then were people that were kind of worked in banking. I, th- I thought all recruitment was in banking then, or these crappy ones that sent me off to to rubbish interviews. So right, I banking ones that I thought were good, uh, and I ended up working at this place, which was incredibly impressive. It was opposite the Bank of England. It was a business called Carrington Fox. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, they got acquired I think anyway you walked into the office there was a knight in shining armor uh, and then uh, they agreed to back me and I ended up running a media marketing and digital division in the midst of their investment banking recruitment business wow. Love and, it. Uh, and yeah it actually went very well and uh, so well in fact that when the 2008 crash happened and they got smacked my business was pretty resilient wow. so, um, and they wanted to then get involved in it in a way that they were quite sort of detached from it before and that wasn't really right for me so uh, I left um, all they, they saw that you were the cash cow and they wanted well, a bit of the milk yeah, and the cream yeah, exactly mm-hmm. and, they, and they were sort of just <laughs> hanging around me and it was uh, you know it's not what I wanted and um, mm-hmm. and, then, and I also did, truth be told I didn't feel like London was the place to be then you know they had right. Lehman Brothers collapsing you did uh, yeah it was a terrible time terrible terrible and lots of people was. leaving mm-hmm. leaving their jobs in London so mm-hmm. I got offered this job in Dubai. I was told it's the forever of uh, the, the land of forever moving cranes. Um, <laughs> got in a plane, came out to Dubai, and it was like the, the crane button got pre- the pause button got hit the, wheel, the minute the wheels touched the ground. Unfortunately, um, the recession arrived in Dubai with a bang. The yep, job I had never really worked out, but um, mm. I, I think all good things happen for a reason. And for me, that. Um, that opportunity to be in Dubai, the opportunity to be here a long time before Dubai got trendy like it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, gave me the opportunity to see what was going on here. And essentially, I, I, I stuck it out. Even though the job I came out to do was 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 a bit rubbish, if I'm honest with you. Mm. I stayed long enough to see Dubai recover quite quickly. Yeah. And then I decided to go for it and wrap up and start my own business in Dubai, servicing the media, communications and digital yeah. world for the middle east so i reskinned the business i left in the in london and that is what um has been the foundation of who we are now so since then we've opened up in um so in dubai riyadh hong kong and singapore the business i opened after dubai was hong kong then we did singapore most recently we've done riyadh and we have an offshore team in philippines and sri lanka phenomenal you need to get over to the uk market i think justin that's what i think I've tried it before and it didn't go very well, but we yeah, can go no. into that. Yeah. I was going to say, we'll do that off camera, I think. I, I absolutely love your story. And what I like is your um, the humility and the vulnerability in, in some of the um, story that you've shared with us. And I like the fact that you've, you know, I, I guess shared, you know, and given that context, because there'll be a lot of people listening 
that know we're in a recession in 2024, but haven't got a clue what the recession actually meant in 2008, 2009. It was, it was catastrophic and it went on for far longer than this one will be. I mean, by the time we share this episode, we might even officially be out of it if Bank of England announced that we're back in GDP growth mode. I guess it depends where, where you sit in the globe when you're listening to this. But I think I'm always very mindful of when people refer to the recession of 2008, 2009, because I think for any business to have flourished or for people to have sort of flourished in their careers during the, or after that period, I don't think you can put any price on that. It, it, that's when I earned my reputation in that market. And, you know, it was very challenging. We didn't have, as an industry, I don't think the recruitment industry, we didn't have things like LinkedIn to, you know, share stories, share vulnerability, create communities, create collaboration. So I'm really grateful for you sharing that with us. And I, and I love the why of why you set up. And I know, you know, MCG is a sort of second version, sort of point two of, of your own business. But I love that that's why you did it. And actually, that's why I set up my business, you know, I set up key recruitment because I felt nobody was servicing recruiters by putting the recruiter at the front of the job search. And so I love the why, because nobody really understood what you do. So in terms of your market, media and digital market, obviously that's, you know, transformed significantly. Um, And and certainly as we record this now in 2024, I imagine there's a lot of things that are sort of shifting parts. But I just want to concentrate, I think, for for now on on the global aspect of, of how you've managed to penetrate and successfully grow across different regions because there are we, we get a lot of leaders listening as well and you know you're doing this I guess with remote and uh, remote access I guess with with all the different teams so how have you created a structure and a scalable operation across different regions how like what's been your, your method and your sort of mode of doing that it, it it's it's been successful and it's been not successful in different different periods of time but you, Fair but enough. you, you learn you learn you learn yeah, you you and mm-hmm. that's that's how you get to where you are now but before before mm. i um, mention that actually you touched on something there about um it being a recession right now in the uk and things being really tough and you know i've worked through you might not even be aware of this but in the middle east we had the oil price crash in 2016 yeah, uh, 15, 16, where pro- a price of oil went from $120 down to like 20. When you're in yeah. a region where everything's reliant on oil, that was <laughs> devastating. OK, let me just be very clear. That was that was worth. I actually think looking back, that was worse than COVID for us uh, in, in the way wow. that we because it hit out of nowhere right at least with covid you knew what was coming you knew you what know? was coming that was wow and i really? was still very early on in my business career and i didn't really know how to deal mm. how to deal with it so mm. that was very painful um but what i've learned in downturns over time is there's always someone hiring now it's a lot yep. harder to get to them it's a lot harder to get to them and you do have to kiss a lot of frogs no denying it right yeah but there is always some, and most businesses really, and I'm talking about businesses that are, I'm talking about big multi, because you know, we're talking about Michael Pages or 100, 300. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about like, your, your hundred, under 100 businesses. Normally, if you look at them, there's there's some key clients there. You're about, you've got about five or six spying clients, right? Yeah. You can find them in a recession. Of course and, you can. And, and you can lose them in a good market as well, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. Your year is always determined by how close you keep on to those really good clients that you've got. And I'll just leave mm-hmm. that support because that's one thing I've learned in from downturns and from good times is you've got, if you've got a good spine, you can get through any market. I um, agree. Right. Now, where we are now is, um, uh, well, and how we got to, got to where we are now really is um, I built sort of a, I built the business here. Originally, it was a 360 business. So okay. I, I, it was me on my own. And uh, and then I brought my brought my first person in uh, in 2012. Now that person was uh, my mum's best friend's son. So okay. very, very thorough interview process. But I think that's what you do in those days, isn't it? You kind of <laughs> you scrap around for whatever you can get. And also, Fair also no one wanted to move to Dubai. I couldn't find any recruiters in Dubai. So you know right. you had to beg, borrow, and steal. My third employee was a guy called Francisco, bless him. He's in he's in uh, Portugal now. I interviewed him and I spoke so much. I didn't even realise he didn't speak English till the end of it. <laughs> um, come on, wait for me. Come on, wait for me. Yeah. Well, and there's a lesson the, there for all the leaders listening. Well, the genius of that story is, is that um, I, you know, I only realised when I went at the end, I went, and you understand what I'm saying? And he was sort of went, when do I start? You know, that I thought, oh, my God. You know, oh, I don't God. think what I said. But the deal was he had to learn English in three months. And he did. 
Not only that, but talked very early on that in creative recruitment, you need to understand what a portfolio looks like. Now, he's okay. an incredibly creative guy. And I okay. got extraordinarily lucky that I struck gold with him. He knew what yeah. great work looked like. Wow. And, and at the time when Dubai was, all our clients that we were going to see in Dubai, they were, they were saying, look, we want, we want these great, there's these amazing creatives coming out of Latin America right now. Do you think you can get hold of them for us? And I thought... Wow, they all wow. speak results. So talk about of luck. Of course, look, that yeah. was definitely fortuitous, Justin. Absolutely. That was not by design, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Excuse so the, 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 well, there you go. And then the, the three amigos, we did year one together, and then I grew. I've got an operations person in, and we grew out by a sector specialist. So we had marketing, communications, right. media, creative, digital, and we scaled and and up to about it was up to about twenty sixteen. There was um, there was about. 18, 20 of us. And then we I, I interviewed Adam, who's my now business partner in the UK, and said, Do you fancy? I was thinking about opening up in London or Hong Kong. Do you fancy opening up one of these offices for me? And he was completely up for Hong Kong. The reason I wanted to do Asia was because when we were looking for expats to move out of the UK, mm. everyone was always going, you know what? I think I want to go to Hong Kong, Singapore, or Dubai. Uh, so I thought, right, if you can't beat them, join them. So join that was them. my thinking. And I thought, if you can understand the intricacies of a market like the Middle East, where you've got all these, you're a hub for a region, surely okay. you can do that in Asia. Mm. And that's, that, you know, and, and it did actually work very, very well. That mm. blueprint moved over there. And then 40% um, of our revenue in Hong Kong was coming out of Singapore. So it made sense to get a license there. And and now today in uh, in Dubai, most of our revenue is coming out of Saudi, believe it or not, but we've never right. based in Dubai. Okay. Um, and so I decided to get a license there. Um, now, what has happened from a structural element in that time is we started off as a 360 business and we okay. are now a layered business. So we have love it. an account management team. We have a new business team. I have unsurprisingly, given my background, invested quite a lot into a marketing team. So we have four people in that. And yep. we decided to put all delivery offshore into uh, Singapore, uh, sorry, Singapore, Sri Lanka and uh, and, Philippines. and that's okay. how we are. I love it. And, and you know, I, I mentioned to you off camera that I joined, I went to the Recruitment Expo in London um, this week in March as we record this now. And the layered approach is certainly one that I think a lot of the um, most vocal oracles in the recruitment industry, who you know, people like Neil Carberry and Gorka Savage, you know, that they are recommending that rather than people just being fixated on the 360 model. So I really like your um your journey and, and your expression of that because I think so many people listening will be sat in a 360 role, not necessarily enjoying one element of it. And I think that that proves you do not need to be that in a box and as a leader you don't need to necessarily have people labeled in certain areas i think you can do that i, I love how you um how, how you sort of express that you know the journey that you went on as well and you know you you clearly got lucky with francisco i love that um i think less lesson learned maybe when you're interviewing people definitely get to know them and get get them to talk first but i think it's a lot a lot of the time things are lucky in business aren't they you get lucky Absolutely. And now, um, you know, I can look back at some of the highest. What's the you know, what's the, the good things that have happened in our business? We've hired some great mm. people. My business mm. partner. I didn't even know him. He's now my business partner. He's runs our agency. Okay. Right. Um, but what some of the really tough things have happened over time? It's been people related as well. Right. Of course. You get, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you don't. And I think some of the painful lessons that I've learned is and, and partly why I've changed structure from a 360 into a, a layered approach is that most of the people that I employed in Dubai, for example, they're from mm. here, right? So I, if you, if you, if you wanted it, you actually get to feel it really intensely when you're in a market like this, because if you're, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm moving people over from the UK or from Portugal or from other places and they're coming to work for us, I, I can only control what happens within work, right? But Absolutely. If happens outside of work if there's a if there's you know if they're not happy in dubai if they're not and if, if things happen to them they might want to leave and that's got nothing to do with our company you know they, they could um, do something stupid at the weekend and the, you know and, and they could get no. you know, leave the country the, all these things are outside of my control right yeah and i've lost a lot of people over time to that and in the old 360 model i would lose a book book of business but i would um, lose a lot of that Right. Oh, I'm 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 emphatic about this point. And when my clients come and ask me, because obviously I, I give a lot of counsel and a lot of guidance to my partners in in business who will say, look, you know, we're a bit concerned. I think 
the benefit of a 360 model is that you are you become that entire entire you know the whole industry you know you know your clients you know your contacts you can move quicker in theory you can become a, a much higher biller but i think the risk is so great to business leaders listening because you like you just said you, it's all the intellectual property that that person takes with you and look you know in life we all know that things that are out of our control there's literally nothing you can do about it you can pr try and prevent you can create support networks you can have you know second plans you know fallback plans etc cetera, etc cetera. but the reality is we're dealing with we are in our business where it's human capital we're dealing with human beings and things happen shit happens that's the truth so i mean really, i really like that approach and i think it's you know i think it's a very honest answer justin to be honest with you i think also Lisa, a good way of testing this is mm. if you ask your team why is it that people enjoy working with us right and if they okay. need can only reference themselves then you have a problem okay mm. now i'm a company. I'm, I believe that your brand, your business, who you stand for, um, what you do, what your expertise, why people, what your values are, those things are what your, your customers and your candidates should be thinking about. And yeah. in the old model, everyone just thinks it's about them and they don't sell, or they sell on them. They don't sell on yeah. the brand and the business. Yeah. And what the layered that approach enables you to do as a business and as an and as, and as employee is think about what the business that you're doing what that machine what that can bring to the table is because it's not just about the individual because what the customer mm. wants to know is what happens if you're not there you know they, they want to know they want to know that they're in safe hands with your business mm. that's what the layered approach does i think it makes it yeah much i agree i think it's a it's a, a much better model for everyone i i agree with you and i think you know, and I want to cover this next is that because of the, the fact that you came from the industry that you represent and, you know, you had the insight, you're thinking as a marketer rather than as a recruiter, you know, you, you, you think about things from a service perspective. It's a solution selling perspective rather than I'm your recruiter and I'm just going to solve your problem for you. So I, I, I think it's, that will really resonate with a lot of people listening. And I, I personally think that's what's been so wrong with the transactional growth of our industry the boom since the, particularly since the recession you know of recruitment companies that just think that that's what they can do and I, and I don't agree with it I think what you said there for me is the um the benchmark of how good recruitment should be done which is that we are providing a solution a service and we should be seen as a professional service and if you are doing that then it's not just that one person so I think I agree with you so you you obviously came from the industry and I think one of the other narratives that I'm seeing an awful lot of is because we've got a bit of a bottleneck, um, certainly since COVID, of the right people being brought into our industry, the right profiles of people. I've always thought that there's a real benefit and advantage to hiring in new recruiters who come from their industry because they have a knowledge, they have a potential network. What are your thoughts on that? And are there any sort of downsides to potentially looking down that avenue? Not necessarily just with Marcoms, but within finance, within actuarial, within legal, tech, et cetera. Mar uh, look, I have a, a, a mantra that a higher attitude, a trained skill. OK, uh, okay. Now, obviously that works to a certain level. Right. Mm. But if I look at the success, of, well, I've told you about two success stories I had, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. but when I look at some of the see, I always have to think about when I hire people out into Dubai or Hong Kong, Singapore, mm. or mm. Saudi, another game, by the way, which, um, which, which is, <laughs> you, you can't just drop an expat into Saudi. They would, they would sink right. away. I have to think about how they would fit culturally. Mm. I have to think how they would fit <laughs> the business model. So actually hiring from industry for us is, it works brilliantly because number one, it just gives us, and your client, as a client, they get this immense sense of credibility from the, from the person. I think right? so. And it, it, honestly, Alicia, it's how I managed to, to to roll to roll up very quickly. And and you know, if you still put it on paper, I didn't have a lot of recruitment experience, but I understood I understood the recruitment nuts and bolts from the time I had in the, in the UK. And the minute we're in we're in the business of solving problems, right? And the minute I could sit in front of a customer and say, I understand the person that you're looking for and the problem you're trying that that the, they would be there to fix. They get this immense calmness and peace mm. of mind because I've sat in their shoes because I know what the problem is and I know the type of person that will fix it. And that's all they want to hear. They want to hear cool. you do that and they want to hear you come back quickly. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's that level of um, empathy, isn't it? And it's knowledge. I think that in my experience, I've only ever seen it where it's not worked. And that was, mm. and I'm like turning the clock back 
25 years when I did engineering recruitment and I'd only been doing the job for two years but I was top I was top biller and so anybody that either came into the team I was a bit of a you know arm around them bit of a buddy scheme which I totally get now as a manager I can see that that's a really great way to sort of champion people and she was an engineering manager that she came from the sector and she was yeah. dreadful she was awful and you know she'd gone through tra- her early training in the, in the company and she just sat there and asked closed questions was very assumptive in all the interviews and I remember pulling her to one side saying oh, I mean I wasn't managing her saying look if you if you keep making assumptions about these people you're not going to actually understand what they do but you need to almost park it and I think because she thought she knew better than them so I've only that maybe that I, I go back to what you said at the start of this part of the conversation I think that's an attitude thing I think she just thought she knew best mm. but I I see it so many times where you know I've placed ex-lawyers who've become top billing legal recruiters because they know the job they've got the credibility they've got the kudos yeah. and I do think it comes down to empathy you know your industry really well so I think my my personal insight into this for anyone listening who's struggling or finding it challenging to bring new talent in, think about your own market. Think about people who've got transferable skills, who want to do the job, who you think could be great for the solution that you're trying to sell. Yeah, yeah. And some of the people that, look, ultimately, I think you need to be a great salesperson mm. in, in as well. And if you've got a natural way about you, if you've got, um, you know, it, it, if you are someone that lights up a room and you can always tell those people quite quickly, I, I immediately zone in on those people because they've yeah, got yeah. that thing about them they, they, mm. that people are going to just buy into straight away. Yeah, I agree. That. And then that person can be a fabulous recruiter. And if mm. they can read the room, you've got to be able to read the room. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you can have all the skills, but if you haven't got Scooby-Doo, what the room's saying, mm. you know, then you're also going to not, not, not going to, not going to do too well in this. We, we don't talk about intuition enough, I don't think, because I don't think that's something that you can train. I don't think you can. And I think what you've just said there, I think people are attracted to similar types of people, but then you create, but then you've got to think about things like diversity. And we're not, I don't think we're talking about that. I think what we're saying is that you are magnetized towards people that you would trust. Because I think, you know, that's who you're going to put your career in the hands of, isn't it? Somebody you trust or, or your next hire is somebody that you think is passionate and enthusiastic and knowledgeable and all of those things. And, it, and I think very often, somebody who's naturally curious and has intuition is probably better than somebody who maybe is saying all the right things. I think it's, it's some, it's all these nuances, isn't it? Yeah. With yeah. human behavior. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. So your industry must be, I mean, we, everyone's talking about AI and the meta effect. What is the impact as we record this now in 2024 of, of where you've seen it? Over, certainly, I mean, AI is just traveling at the speed of sound, isn't it? In terms of even a year ago, it, who was talking about chat GBT? Where, where is it in, impacting your industry? And then in terms of you integrating it into your business, mm-hmm. and then what, what do you see over the next 12 months? Yeah, so let's talk about, um, I'll, I'll break that down then. Chat, okay. First first part, the so where I see it impacting the communication media marketing world. Honestly, I see it, everyone's, there's a lot of talk. There's not a lot of change right now, okay? <laughs> so that, which is quite interesting, right? Yeah. Um, I think if you look at design, creative, I think that people are saying we're on the tip of something, you know, the, the industry become, being completely shaken up. But then again, with the, the roles we're getting briefed on are the same as they were two years ago. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we're all taught, but we're not actually doing anything. Yeah, there's right. a lot of talk okay. and not a lot of action. Here's here's yeah. what I think is going to happen this year. I think we're inevitably going to see jobs coming in. I think first phase, we're going to see jobs coming in. And those jobs that come in are, let's find someone who knows how to use this bloody stuff. Because I don't think a lot of people know yeah. actually how to use it, no. right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm even talking about creative. Everyone's still trial and error. Everyone's still trial and error. So that's going to come in first. And I think inevitably post that, you're going to see a change in the types of jobs we're going to get. But in yeah. any in any mix up, in any um, revolution, if there is that, that you're always going to go through a period where jobs are going to be created and jobs are going to be lost. And I think yeah. it'll balance itself out. The creative industry and communications industry, no doubt, is going to be disrupted i mean you've got p you can produce a press release like that so pr agencies are of course can be disrupted but then again pr agencies can be three times more efficient now so absolutely who's to say that they're going to all be put out for work i think this doom saying this hey everything's going to change they're all gone they're all gone every oh, everyone's going to be a machine rubbish that ain't that ain't happening no. i think people are going to the good will rise to the top as per normal 
and and the bad ones the ones that don't adapt will fall off but there'll be mm. so much coming in that i don't think it's going to change that much yeah so, it's just i think it's it it's humans using ai rather than the ai itself i think that's yeah. the, the the calm way that i would say that and i'm somebody who is not the easiest tech adopter that's partly yeah. because of my demographic i am i'm almost 50 yeah. and i just yeah. don't have a technical brain it's that's the reality yeah. i've got a, a much more creative fluid brain but i see you know if you think about anything that you're doing in life you are using some sort of automation and it's about making our lives easier it's not to yeah. replace the human interaction and i think that's where you know a lot of leaders are a bit worried, but it's about integrating it into your business to make yourself more efficient. It's as simple as that and seeing the opportunity. So I like your that you're setting your stall out. I think it's a it's actually probably the realest answer I've had. <laughs> yeah. Well look, and, and also I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, my wife sold a, a, an HR tech business to mm. uh, Access Group, which has just mm. been integrated with Volcanic. So she mm. built a DE and I um, AI piece of technology with her business partner, Haley. Now that took the bias out of hiring. It was an incredible piece of tech. Amazing. Incredibly hard to put together, right? Mm. Um, and, and and only and that's now been integrated. But it took quite it's taking quite some time to get people even to adapt and change and move forward. So the technology is mm. there. It's just getting people in to use that technology. Using it. Is, mm. is yeah. I think what's going to take some time. From us and our business, how we operate. Now, I am a believer of as having been the husband of someone who's uh, watch someone build scale and sell a tech company yep. Ellen did with 12 people remote having never uh, barely having ever been in the same room I think I don't even think the team ever really got together in the same room wow before. that's amazing so I mean their Christmas parties weren't as much fun as ours but um but they sell for a lot more money right? cheers so, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but it was fascinating to watch and actually in part of watching that and I was I, I was a founder investor in that business as well um, I got to really to look at how the inner workings of a technology company works. And I wanted to apply a lot of that methodology to our recruitment business. I like this. Great. Okay. What I, what I decided to do last year, which was a, a, perhaps a little bit bold, but um, I decided to trim our business, not because we needed to, but because mm. I felt that I could, if I, if I focused on process and tools, yep. Yep. I could make good people more successful. Yeah. And uh, uh, and if I used the systems correctly, then we as a business could grow with fewer people. And my goal has to been to grow our grow our revenue and our profitability. In fact, our yeah. profitability is number one with as little people as possible. Yeah. Right? And few people as possible, not little people. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, that would be the, funny. Munch, the munchkins um, have arrived. Yeah. That's not very. That's not very DEI. Helen wouldn't yeah. be happy. No, I yeah. knew. I knew exactly what you meant. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean. Please, please, can the woke commu committee just sit sit tight for a minute? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, So that's you know, and, and that's what we've done today. So I, the way our our business works, and the reason I've got um, a, a heavily investment into marketing is that we have. At its base point, whenever we what we have is we have a lead gen. We do that offshore. We have a guy in Bangladesh scrapes our Amazing. market. Those the Amazing. job types that we that we look to hire on. Looks yeah. across the Middle East and Asia, takes all the information. We then plug that into our system. We then market to that person. Okay, and we have a, a, a basically a suite of products that targets our potential customers. Yeah. Now it's actually quite often it's it's a, it's a drip campaign if you want to call it okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sixth and eighth interaction with them will we eventually get a response um and that could be you know and that could be well, we're not hiring that could be we are hiring it could be we're hiring down the track goes into our system they then continue to get marketed to we then have a uh, two event people that we put on events put on webinars put in person Love events that. and they they are then taking that information from the people we're emailing so we're creating the events we're constantly creating this flow that yes. feeds into feeds into our team now that is how as how we develop our best relationships with customers that is our strategic business strategy uh, our tactical new business strategies with our existing customers we're talking to them about great talent we're, sh we're sharing you know we're doing all the things that you normally do mm. speaking to people we're talking you know we're saying hey have you thought about this person yeah, yeah. So yeah we've got those two things going on at any given time we then got the offshore team speaking mm. to candidates all the time making sure they're fine making sure they're updated and that's plugging yeah. into the system so that you've got Delivery people that look up, make sure the cans are looked after and our database mm. is clean. Yeah. Client team that make sure our clients are serviced to and they're delivered with Apex Client Care and a marketing and business development team that's constantly bringing in the fresh leads through the table. So I'm doing that with fewer people, right? And they're <laughs> but, but that then your recruiters are just recruiting. 
They're not having to do all of those things. Yeah, yeah. And you've systemized like, the, the Light process. bulb moment. You've systemized yeah. it. It's all automated, presumably. Yeah. And it's all recorded on your ATS, like you say. It's all there as, as the intellectual property that you need to populate. But the recruiters can then still go and do their job. I, I think it's perfect. And I, and I think that there is, that more business owners should talk about the profitability being the, the, the most important thing. Profitability in people. It's not about how many people. It's about the right people in your business. And it's about giving them the right structure to be able to just do their job properly, which you've done. You and I know that a lot of recruitment business owners are driven by ego rather than mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, no, and I don't know what you're talking. What are you talking about? <laughs> Even I went to an event not that long ago. The first person, this recruitment business owner, said, "Hi, how are you doing?" Yeah, he said, "How many people have you got?" I thought, "What is our question?" You know. Um, yep. I know. I, I, I was like, "Well, actually, I've taken our business from forty down to twenty people, and we do the same revenue, and I'm really happy with that." He's like, "All oh, right." <laughs> you know, I don't think he'd had that response before, right? No. It's, I, I do actually think, I mean, and obviously I'm a huge ambassador and advocate for our industry, but I think one of the most poisonous elements of our industry is this whole cock swinging competition about size, because let's be honest, ladies, let's shout it louder, size doesn't matter. Um, and it really doesn't. I think profitability in people, and I think, I mean, I'm a perfect example. There's three of us, but I know for a fact that, you know, you have to go on companies' house that our NFI is far greater than companies that have got 20 or 30 staff. It's not about the size. It's about the people that you have, and it's about the reputation. It's about where you're positioned in the market. It's all of those things. So I love that that was your answer. What What did he respond? Did you ask him back or her? I'm it, saying, it, I'm it, actually, it I opened. I wish I didn't bloody say it now, because he, he, I opened the floodgates up for a gazillion and one questions, because... You know, I think yeah. once I let the guard down, he was. I think he felt a bit more at ease, right? Of course, and, yeah. that is the truth. In any, yeah. I have that all. You can imagine I have that all the time. Yeah, usually it's when I'm saying how are things going. You know, to to somebody that I've known for a long time, how are things? Oh yeah, yeah, it's great. And I'm like, oh, and they'll say how are things going? They'll say, well, actually, I've had a really, really shitty start to 2024 because we're in a recession. So funnily enough, not because client, I agree with what you said before. People are always hiring, but why would you move jobs right now? So I've got too much integrity to let people move unless they really, really have to. So it's obviously slowed down my revenue, which it has. I'd predicted yeah. it. I knew it would happen, and it'll. I'll be fine. I'll trade out of it. We, it goes in cycles, and it means those people that have said do not move. Who are they going to turn to? They're going to come to me. And I give that answer and they go, actually, we've had a really terrible Q1 as well. And I'm like, there you go. As soon yeah. as you open up your with honesty and vulnerability, you are creating a much better dialogue. So I, so I love that. That's, that's hilarious. Well, I mean, look, this we, we could talk. We could talk for, for days by the sounds of it. And I, I think I love that you referred to Helen. Actually, we must get Helen on with her incredible business that she I did actually have a little spite her when I was looking at your profile. Justin, how can people get in touch with you? Are you a LinkedIn proficient person you, you like people to connect you over there uh, absolutely as, as as many of my uh, friends tell me they see too bloody much of me on linkedin oh, wow. but um there you go no, such, no such thing there's a, that's, that's a the link, way linkedin tart here so yeah. don't you worry about it yeah, oh, it's, been, it's been really brilliant thank you so much for being on have you enjoyed it yeah absolutely loved it very good fun oh, i know it's been really good and thank you for joining us and for anyone who wants to get in touch with justin make sure you do drop him a LinkedIn connection request. I'm sure that's something he'd love to pick up with you. And all the very best. And we hope that uh, it's a very prosperous year for you for 2024 and beyond. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you very much.